Okay, so we're going to continue now with this example. And again, there's a lot of detail in this example, but I want to use this as an opportunity to introduce things like pseudo instructions as we have been doing. So once we've told the system or asked the system using v0 equals 4 to draw out on the screen the, uh, the ASCII address specified by str, now we're going to tell the operating system that we're done. And that's what this does. Load immediate v0 10. Uh, puts the number 10 into v0 using or immediate instead of actually li because li is not a real instruction. Uh, and then syscall looks at that register, says 10 means I'm done. right? If you look at the uh, service calls, 10 means exit. Oops, there we go. 10 means exit. I'm done. Your program is over. So that's the end of your instruction memory. Then we write in your data memory. Uh, here are some more things for system call. These are the other things you can do for system call. And again, they're on your sheet as well to have a look at. Finally, we have a data segment. The data segment is all of the data that's going to live in the data memory of the machine. Okay. We use dot data to start the data segment. And then we use an instruction called, or an assembler directive called dot ASCII Z to put the ASCII numbers into the data segment for us. Each ASCII character is 8 bits long, memory is 8 bits wide, so each one of these characters is going to be at a single address, and four of them together will make a word. Okay, so this string is going to be put into memory, and then a null character is going to be put at the end, that's why it's ASCII Z. Uh, that null character tells the uh, syscall 4 to finish displaying code at, or finish displaying ASCII characters at that um, null termination character. And again, this stuff is all on your sheet. Here are some, whoops, here are some directives, uh, assembler directives, right? Dot data stores the data segment, dot text stores the text segment, dot ASCII Z stores the ASCII, null terminated, and a bunch of others that you can look at later on. So we'll go back here and look at this. So what does the ASCII get stored in memory look like? Well, let's talk a little bit about ASCII because that's important. Um, I think you've seen this in your other classes as well, but ASCII is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It's just another way of interpreting a collection of bits as some information. Right now, we can interpret a collection of bits as an integer, as a two's complement number. Now we can interpret it as an instruction, if there's 32 of it. And now that we've talked about ASCII, we can interpret it as a string of characters. Each 8-bit segment corresponds to a single ASCII character. So if I give you a 32-bit number, it could be any of those things. And it can be any of those things. But the way you interpret it depends on how you tell the computer what it is, right? And so when we um, present information to the ALU, for example, we have to tell the ALU if we're adding unsigned or signed. And same thing here. If we're presenting information to the display, we have to tell it to interpret it as an ASCII character. And so that's what syscall4 does, export and display on the screen an ASCII character. And there's a different system call for export and display on the screen, a string, a double, a float, an integer, right? All of these things can be interpreted differently and displayed differently. So ASCII is kind of neat. It's got a lot of different characters. This is how ASCII works. And again, if you learned it in 201, then you probably already know that each 8-bit, or actually 7-bit, um, corresponds to a single character. You may not know that there are some clever arrangements in the way that this is put together. For example, the first two rows, whoops, the first two rows are all special characters. Null is 0, 0, 0, 0. This is how you add, uh, null terminate a string. And then there's like a bell which rings, uh, makes a little noise. There are line feeds and carriage returns and, and file formats and a bunch of stuff like that. The other thing that's interesting about ASCII is that each letter is in a, is in a location that corresponds to its uh, other case. So an uppercase letter is almost exactly the same as a lowercase letter. The only difference is in bit 5. Bit 0, 1, 2, and 3 are all the same. Bit 4 and bit 5 is different for an uppercase letter. Bit 5 is 0. For a lowercase letter, bit 5 is 1. And in fact, all uppercase letters have bit 5 as 0, and all lowercase letters have bit 5 as 1, just as an example. The other thing that's interesting 
is that um, the numbers, the characters that represent numbers, are aligned with the second hex, hex digit. So if the first hex digit is 3, then the number that is the second hex digit corresponds to the symbol that represents the character of that number. So you have to know if you're looking at a character, whether that's the number itself or whether that's the character representing that number. Anyway, ASCII. ASCII is great. So when we display ASCII, we actually put an address to the first character in the string, and then we start displaying other characters as we go until we get 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff about extended ASCII. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It's interesting. It's worth knowing um, that the full 8-bit representation can be different things depending on which extended ASCII you're doing. Uh, in the olden days of DOS, the extended ASCII used these uh, box characters to draw <laughs> the actual windows. Uh, we don't do that anymore, but it was kind of interesting. Uh, Unicode is better than ASCII because it's much, much bigger and you can specify hundreds or thousands of different characters. But the problem with Unicode is that we leave it up to the manufacturers to interpret the instructions for the, for example, emojis, right? So for an emoji, uh, there's one that is called, what is it called? Um, frowning girl. And you can see the different, this isn't true anymore. I think mostly this has been fixed, but you can see that the different um, manufacturers interpret that significantly differently. Uh, if you send this emoji via Apple or Google, you might be seen as being sad, but if you send it via Facebook or Samsung, you might be seen as being angry. Again, these things change over time, but it's worth knowing there are different encodings. And again, it's just a string of bits that then the computer interprets. So um, these binary encodings, then again, we have four different ways. I said this already. We have four different ways of interpreting any random string of characters, and you have to know which one is being invoked to know what a string of bits actually corresponds to. All right, data and text, we talked about this already. The interesting thing about this is that when the ASCII characters are stored in memory, uh, you'd think they'd just be stored in starting at memory address str and going down in memory, uh, but they're not actually because um, MIPS is in fact little endian, which means when you have a four word, a four byte word together, the small, the, the least significant word, or the least significant byte is stored first. And that is also true when you're talking about words of ASCII characters, which is frustrating and dumb and, and just, again, these little details are so frustrating, but when you actually look at it, you can understand how it happens. You don't understand why they decided it this way or, or add that it makes sense at all, but it exists. So if you look, again, I'm gonna go back to our, um, oops, Done. Here we go. I'm going to go back to our original display and sh look at um, the ASCII code that corresponds to the hello world, right? This is the beginning of that string, and this is the ASCII code that corresponds to the hello world. If you look up these codes in binary in ASCII, this 6C actually corresponds to the letter L, not the letter H. It's not H E L L O space W O, it's H. E L L O space W O R L D like that, which is stupid, <laughs> but it's because it's little endian, and so of a 32-bit word, the least significant word, uh, least significant byte is stored first. This is uh, this is what I mean by that. If you look at this, this is the list that you saw in the code. Um, that you actually were looking at in the simulator. And this is like the addresses in memory, starting at lower addresses and going down. Um, and so when you actually store it in memory, it does store it character by character. But when the interpreter looks at it, it interprets it as a 32-bit word, and so it loads it up little endian. And so although in the assembler it looks all backwards and weird, in the memory it'll be all in the right order as you can see it go down. Hello world with a space. By the way, uh, ASCII 20 is a space. And then you'll see the last one, 00, zero is your null terminator. And 0A is your carriage return. So those are all the special characters that you'd see in that list, starting at lower addresses and going down bit by bit. But each word, each 32-bit word, corresponds to four ASCII characters, and they are stored like this. <laughs> I love that animation. Watch this. Like that. So they're sort of turned and gone backwards but not in the memory, just in the assembler's interpretation of the memory, because the assembler knows 
that MIPS is little endian. So when you look at the assembler, don't be surprised if you see some complexity like this. And that's again right here. <clears throat> okay, so the um, encoding is, is what we'll look at next. So this is the um, the way the actual 32 bits for each instruction is stored in memory. We'll look at that in the next video.